And again, a link will be posted. Today's program is part of the Henty Pyle Distinguished Lecture Series, and um, that is coordinated by Ford Risley. Uh, he's a Historical Society uh, Board of Governor and member and an Associate Dean for Undergraduate and Graduate Education in the College of Communications. And um, Ford will um, be introducing our speaker today. And with that, Ford, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Mary. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Brown, uh, author of the first inauguration, George Washington and the Invention of the Republic. Steve is a liberal arts professor of communication arts and sciences at Penn State. He is a rhetorical critic with particular interest in public memory, social movements, and early American history. He's the author of five books, including The Ides of War, George Washington, and The Newburgh Crisis. Uh, the title of his talk today is George Washington's First Inaugural Address and Why It Still Matters. Uh, he's going to discuss the festivities leading up to the inauguration, uh, what the first president had to say about the event, and the legacies he gave to the American people. Uh, today's program, as Mary said, is part of the Distinguished Lecture Series that is underwritten by the Ann Hamilton Hensey Pyle and Kenneth Pyle Educational Fund for Regional Heritage Preservation. Anne is the great granddaughter of Moses and Urban Thompson and great, excuse me, great, great granddaughter of Moses and Urban Thompson uh, and uh, great granddaughter of John Hamilton whose contributions to regional history are honored at the Center Furnace Mansion and by the Center County Historical Society. Kenneth, who acquired a love of history growing up in State College, is the Henry M. Jackson, Jackson Professor of History and International Studies Emeritus at the University of Washington, where he taught history for many years. Uh, welcome, Steve. Uh, we're so glad you could join us today, and uh, we'll turn things over to you. Well, thank you, and and and, and thank you all uh, for showing up on this blustery, beautiful uh, day in, uh, in in Center County. Let me be sure to. Uh, uh, right off the bat, uh, uh, extend my thanks to to Mary and Ford of, of for, for the invitation, uh, and uh, as well as to Ken and uh, Anne, whom uh, I have not met but but uh, hope to one day. Um, I'm saying the obvious, but I'm going to say it anywhere that this society is uh, is a treasure to the Commonwealth, and um, I'm I'm very grateful uh, to to be with you here this afternoon. Well. 232 years ago next month, as you perhaps know, um, George Washington was probably pacing about uh, the front rooms of uh, Mount Vernon uh, when on April 14 of 1789, the Secretary of Congress, Charles Thompson, rounded the way on his horse and uh, jumped off and delivered um, what was news or a shock to no one. Um, at least of all uh, to uh, George Washington. Um, he was ready and indeed uh, Thompson upon uh, delivering a sort of formal announcement to uh, Washington uh, was responded to in kind by a prepared uh, script, uh, so to speak, for, um, uh, by way of response. Um, thus began uh, an, an extraordinary journey um, a, an extraordinary journey for Washington, uh, of course, uh, an extraordinary journey for the country, and on a rather less exalted note, a, an extraordinary journey uh, for me as someone who uh, ha has, has sought to sort of tell that uh, story, uh, however uh, modestly. It winds up, as you know, after a week or so, at Federal Hall in uh, Manhattan, uh, where Washington uh, on the uh, 30th of April, upon taking the oath of office uh, on, the, on the balcony uh, before 
uh, a reported uh, thousands and much uh, huzzahing and, and cannon blasting and so forth, turns, walks into the uh, upper floor of Federal Hall and delivers what will become uh, the first of 59 inaugural addresses. And that uh, in some ways uh, underscores the, the, the theme for us this uh, afternoon. So in pursuit of that moment, um, what, I, what I'd like to suggest is that the speech, while obviously a, a, a key episode, might best be understood as part of a, of a whole process, uh, and, and indeed a, a process leading up to it that tells us perhaps as much about the America of the time, perhaps America uh, uh, today, uh, as, uh, as the speech proper. So, to that end, um, let, let's proceed as roughly along these lines, and I'll try to be uh, mindful of the time. Of course, uh, that's hard for professors, but, but I'll keep an eye on the clock so that we have time for questions or discussion. I mean, how, how great is this for me to be able to spend an afternoon with you all talking about uh, Washington? You know, these things don't come along very often, so I wanna, I wanna max it out and, and hear uh, what you have to say. So let's take a look, uh, we'll kind of start general and, and we'll take a look at what it is that we're talking about. That is to say, uh, the, the whole notion I mean, uh, of the uh, uh, inaugural address. Um, then we'll turn to uh, the, the person, the, the speaker himself for, for a little bit, um, then talk about the trip, uh, then his arrival and the speech itself. And we'll conclude with some uh, thoughts about uh, um, its legacy. Or, 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 or legacies uh, broadly, okay. The question is basic, but it's, but it's, but it's a good one. I, 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 the older I get, the more I like uh, basic questions, I have to say. And, and the first one here is why? Why do presidents give inaugural addresses? They don't have to, you know. Uh, there's not a word in it in uh, in the Constitution. It's not mandated there at all. And indeed, in in my reading, which is pretty extensive in the constitutional debates in Philly and then the ratification debates thereafter, I've never seen a word uh, about anything approaching the, the idea of a of an inaugural address. It is true, of course, that the Constitution does require what we now call something like a State of the Union, uh, or, or report to Congress about what's up for the year, but, but not a word uh, about the inaugural, or the, the inaugural uh, address for that matter. We do know, of course, that Washington didn't, Washington didn't invent the genre. I mean, it, it dates back variations on the theme, but it dates back well into uh, the uh, 17th century uh, English uh, political history. For instance, rituals of office taking, you see um, they, they are fairly pervasive in the uh, colonies and the provinces as well, say upon the assumption of a governor uh, to, to, to office. And we have a pretty good record uh, of those. But I don't think it's stretching the matter, maybe, I don't know, uh, but I'll say it anyway, that presidents give inaugural addresses because George Washington gave an inaugural address. That's why. <laughs> uh, and to run a counterfactual, uh, we might uh, imagine uh, today or in the years to come, what if a president, which would be completely within her or, or his rights, to say, nah, I don't think so. Well, I think I'll give a pass on it uh, this time. That would, in some sort of vague sense, it seems to me, strike us as a, a sort of a deep uh, transgression against what turns out to be uh, 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 sometimes rough and tumble uh, and kind of a sleeves rolled up, but nevertheless, very, very important tradition uh, in, in the American experience. And, and so we would, I think, acknowledge right out of the gates, uh, Washington's influence simply in giving uh, the uh, an inaugural address uh, as such. Well, if you're gonna write a book on an, an inaugural address, you have to sit down and read all the inaugural addresses. That, and that's part of the deal. Um, sometimes painful, uh, not, not always, um, uh, but even given the, which I did, of course, uh, and, and, um, and, and asked what it was that might be uh, uh, generalizable. I mean, given obviously all the historical uh, differences and so on, is there anything that we can sort of generalize 
in these kind of opening moments here this afternoon about the nature of the genre itself as what we would call a, a, a rhetorical genre. None of these will come as a surprise to you. I mean, I, I think there are such generalizations. They're not, uh, they won't be shocking and they're not supposed to be. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, we would want to uh, acknowledge uh, several such uh, features of the inaugural functions that um, for the most part are going to show up uh, really quite predictably um, uh, to greater or lesser degrees of eloquence for sure, but they're probably uh, going to be there. Um, one is these can, would be the functions of the inaugural uh, address as a rhetorical form. Um, one is of course, is that they tend to feature, tend, uh, to feature some sense that the office um, stands before the person. Um, and again, these will be sort of homely truths and, and verities and, and, and purposes, but part of the book, um, or part of my argument uh, is, is that although they might be familiar, um, um, we, we, we become complacent about them, I, I, I think, at uh, our peril. And indeed, it's no small um, achievement of the Republican experience uh, experiment um, to insist upon that sense that in, in, in some ways the office uh, is greater than the person. It's what a, a, in the rhetorical tradition is called the, in the, from the Latin, the ingratio, uh, which we get the word ingratiation, but it's that sense of presenting oneself um, as um, as a sort of an artifact of a greater situation at hand here. Conversely, what's being suggested, it's not about me. It's not all about me, <laughs> right? Okay, secondly, <clears throat> again, to no surprise, but we would acknowledge that for the most part, for the most part, um, we're going to see uh, some assurances uh, sort of coded into the inaugural address, whether they're short or long. Um, uh, and there have been very short ones, the shortest of all being, of course, Washington's second inaugural, which is, is all of uh, three sentences, and then interminable ones like William Henry Harrison's that, that, that went on forever. But one way or another, um, in addition to the, um, the, the sense of the office being greater than the person, um, we would expect some assurances about safe passage <clears throat> that the handoff. This won't be a huge problem for uh, Washington, but soon enough, by 1800, things uh, are, are gonna get very bumpy indeed. Um, and so this, this kind of sense that, that, hey, it's gonna be okay. That, that the Republican experiment is still holding, we're, we're transitioning, but, but it's gonna be uh, okay. Thirdly, you'll often find, well, you will uh, always find uh, a, 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 an effort to identify those principles which allegedly, I mean, the winners always get to call this, right? But those principles that would uh, underwrite the American people as they are defined at that time um, uh, in a way that um, is up to the task of keep, keeping us uh, stuck together uh, as a people. So you'll get uh, oftentimes, and Jefferson's, is a, Jefferson's first is a perfect example of this sort of a, 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 a a summary account of those principles um, that keep this that provide the sinews, right? The bonds that tie. Those can get stretched, as Jefferson knew they did get stretched. Okay, and then um, invariably, again, in different kind of ways, one will expect a, a, an appeal to the divine. And we'll see interesting examples of that in, in, in Washington's uh, uh, address as well. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so that said, I know that's terribly broad, but that's all right. We, we, we're still we're still sort of setting our coordinates into the into the subject matter properly. But we'll take it down now. Let's go a little tighter in uh, on the speaker uh, himself. Um, as you might imagine, this is no small. <laughs> 
so to speak. This is it's like, you know, there were moments where I thought, you know, who hasn't written about Washington? I mean, you know, so, so just navigating the, uh, the, the, the scholarship, much less the, the primary sources was uh, a considerable challenge uh, uh, to say the least. Um, but it was useful. This is now my second book on, on, on Washington. And, and I've read, you know, I mean, I'm 63 now. I can't just like go on for, forever, but I've read a whole lot of, of Washington scholarship uh, from early on, indeed, during his very life till yesterday. You know? And uh, I think we have a little brush clearing to do, uh, if you don't mind, if we're going to kind of get a bead on Washington and what he's up to and how we can sort of more richly understand uh, the legacies. Uh, for instance, we got to and this is just me, but but I, I, I earned my scars in a sense in, in reading it. Um, there's it seems to me that underbrush that keeps it going are these sort of um, sort of myths that I'm not saying everyone or, or anything, but they, they tend to be pr pr pretty uh, persistent. And I'd like to sort of clear that out uh, a little bit before we move in. Um, one uh, myth, shall we call it, um, respecting uh, the speaker, uh, uh, Washington, is one that I, I had to attend to because what I study, um, this is not about me, but, uh, but my, my interest is in, is in words and language and what people do with them to get things done in the world and all that. Well, the thing about Washington, if, if you were to read an awful lot of this scholarship, indeed, if you were to look at your dollar bill or on that painting, um, Maybe they've taken them all down. Uh, I don't know. In your in your grade school uh, a classroom of George Washington, you look at a very stern man, <laughs> the strong, silent type, right? A man who's used to get command, yes, but command in a few words, that that sort of thing, right? So there's almost a calcification that has gone on uh, with Washington that that one has to sort of struggle again against if you want them to if you want to hear him talk right well it's tough if I were to believe the scholarship to get this guy to talk much because he just apparently a wave of the hand will do it or a nod of, of authority or something well I'd like to posit that that's baloney um, that's absolute baloney. If you you live here in Center County, you can go to Petit and look on the first floor at the Washington Papers. It runs like eight feet of those volumes, like 32 volumes. They're like four or 500 pages each. The man was suffused in language. Now, did he, did he write all of that or was he the original author? No, no one's saying that. I'm suggesting though that this is a man who was up to his neck in words, language, right? In, in ways that we need to uh, appreciate. For that matter, look at the sort of the text that we can just off the bat, um, and I'll get off this, but it's important, as I say, to clear this brush out. You know, we can think of from, um, oh, I don't know, the, the Newburgh Address. Of course, I'm biased there, but that's when he shut down that incipient coup d'etat, if you want to push that a little bit. Uh, one of my favorites is the circular letter to the states while he's still in Newburgh and the army is uh, is drawing down or, or has drawn down and he's sending people home. He writes this circular letter that is astonishingly uh, uh, insightful and well-written. And then of course we have the uh, uh, inaugural address itself. And then to, to wrap it up with the uh, the farewell address. This is not a man for whom language uh, is, uh, you know, is alien in, in any sense. And of course, he also was smart enough uh, to get people like Hamilton and Madison and others to help him um, to uh, write it out. More about that in a bit. But uh, I think we need to dispossess ourselves, maybe not you, but um, dispossess ourselves of this image of him as a strong, silent type. Sure, he was a strong, silent type. But um, he also understood language, and that's because he understood power. <laughs> More on that a bit. There's a second kind of enduring mythology I would associate with um, uh, Washington that I think it would be um, healthy to kind of uh, dismiss. And that's in part owing to the farewell address, but really uh, generations and generations of scholarship that uh, pegged him as somehow the ultimate statesman above the fray of 
party and, and partisan uh, animosities. As I just mentioned, this man understood better than anyone else living, I would argue, uh, in, in, in his time, um, power. Uh, he knew power. Uh, he, uh, he, and you don't understand and, and operate under those contexts um, by somehow uh, posing uh, of oneself above it. He had a particular vision of how power was to operate uh, in, in the world, uh, obviously, that wasn't reducible merely to uh, party politics. But I find it very hard to uh, assent to the argument that um, Washington was above it all. You don't get to be president of the United States of America, the first president, by being above it all. I'm not buying it. Okay. And then the third one, just uh, it bears mentioning, is um, it, it, Washington, as near as I can tell, uh, was exactly what he said. Uh, that is to say, uh, I'm no biographer, I, I don't have that kind of mind, but. I'm not so sure there's was or ever will be a sort of a hidden Washington. I mean, we're all human. We all have our, uh, you know, inaccessible sides. But but what, what the thing about Washington, and, and as a scholar of Washington, it, he he provides the rare gift for someone like me who's interested in words and all that. What he says, he meant. <laughs> that again, it, kind of obvious, but. It, it, uh, it relieved me of the, uh, of the effort, which is, can be kind of annoying of trying to, of reading between the lines or the ironic subtleties or anything. He might be the most literal human being who ever lived. I'm, I'm not sure, but when he said something, every evidence seems to suggest, damn it, he meant it. <laughs> That's exactly what he meant. So it, it make, it make, it's not easy, but it makes it a lot more uh, direct to, to be able to, to, to work with, uh, with such an image. Well, okay, um, the, the, the person of, of Washington uh, him, himself, right? As I mentioned, and as you know, uh, it came as no surprise to anyone that of course he would be, uh, as it was unanimously um, uh, elected. He's ready uh, and uh, and within a few days uh, on the 16th of April, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, after he packs and everybody's ready, he and uh, Charles Thompson and, um, and David Humphreys and, and aide will um, start off. The trip takes a, a week uh, about. Um, uh, I had uh, uh, rented a car and drove down. I thought I would, I would try to get as close as I could to the exact route, you know. But of course, it turns out to be one of the most heavily tra trafficked uh, uh, thoroughfares in, in the world or something. So uh, there, it was kind of hard to romanticize it along those lines. But we know we can, uh, and thanks to the marvelous work of the people involved with, with the Washington Papers, we have a, this great uh, record. So they leave uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, Martha does not come. She'll, she, that, that'll be a couple months down, down the way. Uh, she and, and others are, will, will pack up and, and take care of that. It's just, so it'll be just the three fellas, uh, at least uh, starting off. Um, without going into the weeds too much, but just to kind of give a sense of the, uh, of the route, uh, as it were, and this is all very well established um, in, in the scholarship. So they leave Mount Vernon. And then for those of you who have been there, probably a lot, just what is it, 10, 12 miles down the road, you've got Alexandria. And then, sure enough, that's where they got to stop for lunch and a meal and uh, speeches, the mayor turns out. And, uh, and, and we have a good, good uh, record of, of all that went on. There, I think that tavern is, is still there. By the way, um, off they go. Ultimately, then uh, they'll they'll go through. There will be little stops along the way, but these will be the bigger, the bigger stops up to to, to Baltimore, um, Wil Wilmington, uh, Delaware, and then into Philly for for a, a few days, um, up to Trenton across the river now, and up to Trenton, then continuing east, and then up a little bit to um, Elizabethtown. 
uh, as it was called in the day, uh, and then uh, on board the barge and into the upper harbor, they'll land uh, by what's now right around uh, the Battery in, in, in lower Manhattan. Um, the marvelous part of my journey uh, uh, that, that, that I found so interesting was um, th these stops al along the way. And um, without flogging the book thing, I, I just want to sort of try to communicate um, how um, lively and uh, turned out, <laughs> as it were, this procession was. There are antecedents here, of course, and those are like European royal uh, processions. So some effort was made uh, and some embarrassments uh, were made uh, and some criticism along the way that this is getting a little over the top, you know, that uh, is it entirely appropriate for um, a, a, a so-called president, people are still getting used to that word, kind of a weird word, like John Adams was saying like that, you, president, that, that's what you call like the coach at our team up in Boston, you know, so they're still getting used to that word, but is it, is it really consistent with um, re Republican professions to be putting on the dog like this a lot? And it seems for, for some, not many, because you didn't criticize Washington publicly, at least uh, very much, but it could get a bit much, you know, so even Washington himself would uh, on occasion um, uh, ask that, the, um, say, the, uh, the local militia, um, why, why don't you fellas go home and get yourself something to eat or something. I don't really need a, 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 all of this along the way. He did that half a dozen times. because It was getting a bit much. I found more interesting um, what uh, was said during these uh, stops. And I, I promise I won't, you know, rehearse this in, in details, but um, I, I could identify um, fairly significant uh, moments of wherein Washington, sometimes it's hard to tell, would either speak um, or um, impromptu or read from a script, or perhaps um, I suspect sometimes would have uh, sort of boilerplate kind of delivered to the, to the, to the townspeople um, that, that he was addressing. But we have really good um, evidence of uh, what was said at first in Alexandria, then off they go to Baltimore, where he speaks to the citizen and, and the mayors and the local worthies who all turn out. Um, in Wilmington, Delaware, um, not only the mayor and the aldermen and, and, and the folks, but also the uh, society uh, uh, of manufacturers, as they were called. And I, I was interested to note how many um, of these sort of local um, I think they, they, they seem like the, roughly the equivalent of um, the, the local JCs uh, for these various who are very interested and anxious about what all of this meant for um, the bottom line. I mean, is Republicanism a good thing for uh, the economy? Who knew? See, part of this, why, again, I, I mentioned this. Uh, embarrassment and, and some faux pas even and uh, about the the seeming royalty of the procession and these is as you know but I mean they're trying to figure out republicanism as it goes it's not as if there was a much of a model right there's literally nothing like this in the world and let it be said as it was said uh so many times that the track record on this whole thing with Republican, they weren't using the word democracy yet in a few years, but, but not yet. Uh, but the Republican experiment, um, whew, more on this in a bit, but the track record's not real great because as Aristotle understood the seeds of democracy um, carry within it uh, the threat of its own ruin. Right, so that's, they're, they're trying to figure out the, the stuff out as they go along, including um, uh, economically. Now, here we go into Philadelphia, across the river and into down uh, what, you know, um, still d d downtown, right? Um, I'm not sure if I quite believe this, but the records I was able to look at at the uh, 
the Pennsylvania Historical Society and, and, and so on, and the various archives in, in, in Philly at the time, which would have been about neck and neck with New York as the largest cities in the country, that about maybe a third, the, 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 the record seems to indicate that between a third and a half of the population of the entire city uh, turned out to welcome uh, Washington uh, in, into town. Right, that seems a, kind of like a lot, but but, but maybe I, um, hard to say. Um, he's busy in, in Philadelphia uh, for, for uh, obvious reasons. That's that's where it's all happening, and he's fairly uh, familiar with with the town, of course, after the Constitution and, and so on. But um, I've been able to identify speeches to and then responses from um, the society, the brand new um, ish uh, society of the Cincinnati. That's had, kind of had a rough going uh, out of the gates, but it, but it, it persisted, um, subject to a lot of criticism, uh, but it's still around. Uh, for those of you interested, the Society of the Cincinnati, uh, he delivers a, an address and a response uh, to, the, to the mayor's office. He addresses the, um, the judiciary uh, of, of Pennsylvania. He addresses the... Um, what we would call something like the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania. And then towards the end, he addresses the uh, Pennsylvania uh, legislature, again, all of whom are in this sort of ritualized, almost call and response uh, uh, reply. Well, better get out of town though. He's a military man. Uh, so it's up uh, early. Once again, the militia turns out to usher him out. He finally uh, has to uh, send them away. But up we go to Trenton. Now, this is crazy, um, and the, the cover, I couldn't resist the cover of the book showing this, but um, if you're familiar with this, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, it was much picked up on in the 19th century, and there's some famous lithographs and, and all, wherein, uh, on the news of Washington's arrival, uh, the ladies, the women uh, and mothers of Trenton, uh, having been prepared for this moment, have... Uh, uh, coach their daughters uh, in, in such a way and festoon the bridge that he will uh, ride over on his horse. Uh, the girls and the moms all show up and they welcome him with song and uh, flower petals, which being April, yeah, I, so, so the reports go, they're, they're, they're draping the, the path before him these young girls and they're all dressed in white uh, singing this song and Washington crosses. He uh, alights from his horse and delivers a, uh, a brief um, note of thanks to the mothers, the women and the daughters of, of Trenton, New Jersey. And, uh, and off he goes then um, and takes him a few days to get up to Elizabethtown, um, which as you know, is sort of across the water from, from New York um, onto the barge he goes, accompanied by all manner of anything that will float and make a lot of noise and, and color and so on. And off he goes, um, where he's welcomed in lower Manhattan and is on his way. Okay, that's it. Let's turn to the speech. Um, it'll, so he, 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 gets, um, uh, he gets there on, on the 23rd, so he's got about a week uh, to get uh, his, his lodgings. He's out on Cherry. Um, it's, by, it's by the, um, the, his house is by sort of the Manhattan end of what's now the Brooklyn Bridge, if, if you're familiar with that area on the, on the east side. Um, well, the time comes, and so Washington, as I mentioned, uh, uh, comes before the people. Um, some people on the street and of course um, the government such as it exists uh, at the time. Remember um, North Carolina and uh, Rhode Island are, are still out. Um, that's how experimental this whole thing is, uh, by the way, right? <laughs> it doesn't even have a full contingent. Uh, 
what will become a full contingent in front of him. Well, the speech uh, itself is about uh, 1400 uh, words long, 1419, uh, if you happen to be counting, and disposes itself into um, uh, six paragraphs as, 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 as we received it. Um, it's not the first version uh, of that speech. And in fact, I mentioned David Humphreys, his aide. He asked uh, Humphreys to see if he couldn't pull something together and it turned into a 65 page beast. Right. Well, Madison is um, just, just that Christmas uh, of, of, of 88 um, is uh, stops by and Washington says, would you take a look at this? And Madison does he and says, this isn't going to happen. And so the two of them hunker down for a few days and, 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 and put this together. As I say, it's about um, uh, six speeches or so. And I'll just start. Um, um, guess what? It unfolds almost exactly, not entirely, but but how, how we might expect, where you, you first get that uh, ingratio, this uh, notion that, um, hey, um, um, that, that um, is characteristically Washington, you know, I had really had hoped to stay at Mount Vernon uh, and live out my days, but when the time comes, you got to step up and, and, and serve uh, your country. He's, um, he provides a rather pointed uh, vision uh, for what he hopes um, will underwrite the experiment, uh, the, the Republican uh, experience, um, uh, appeals uh, to the divine and um, uh, identifies um, those principles he understands to be up to the task of keeping us hanging together in a very volatile world. Remember, it's only a matter of a couple months before the Bastille goes down. Things are about to get very hot in the uh, uh, Atlantic world. As I say, I want to keep an eye on the, on the, on the clock here, um, but I can't resist, if you don't mind, just a few passages for those of you perhaps not familiar with it, with the speech. Um, uh, it's 18th century prose. Um, <laughs> it's not Lincoln prose. It's, it's 18th century prose, so, so I promise to keep this short, but, but just to give kind of a flavor and then We'll move towards a conclusion. This is from uh, the, the second paragraph. <clears throat> no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. That's a very deistic way of, uh, of, of, of putting the matter, but uh, this notion of the invisible hand or uh, divine agency uh, shows up on, on, on a number of occasions. This is what I meant when I, I suggested that um, there were, to no surprise, but there'll always be this effort to identify those, um, those absolutely basic principles that have got to be in place uh, to, to make this all work. This is from the third paragraph. I behold the surest pledges that as on one side, no local prejudices or attachments, no separate views nor party animosities will misdirect the comprehensive and equal eye which ought to watch over this great assemblage of communities and interests. So on the other hand, that the foundations of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality and the preeminence of a free government be exemplified by all the attributes which can win the affections of its citizens and command the respect uh, of the world, right? Um, this is the sacred fire of liberty uh, that, that, he's, that, that he's talking about and to which he refers in, in the speech uh, itself. Again, because of time, if you don't, I'll, I'll round out then. Um, as you can imagine, and there were no uh, inaugural balls as such yet, but there is, believe me, there's plenty of uh, drinking, uh, eating, and dancing 
uh, in M Manhattan uh, for the next uh, couple months, uh, actually. So when Martha comes up, they just kind of do, do it all again. Uh, they did like their Madeira, I must, I must say, um, and, and more the better. No wonder they all had gout. If you look at the menus, <laughs> it's pretty uh, uh, remarkable. Um, listen, uh, to conclude, I, I, I confess I, I'm always a little uh, uneasy when uh, oftentimes in talking about this stuff, I, I get asked like, well, what would the founders say today or last year or something? And and um, there's reasons for that, that that I won't bore you with. I mean, you can get kind of preachy in a hurry and, and I have trouble with kind of yanking the historical context and, and reapplying them. But uh, it would be naive to think that uh, what's going on here in on April 30th before and after of 1789 uh, remained where it was. Um, and indeed, uh, 50 year anniversaries uh, of the inauguration have been celebrated in the American experience uh, uh, um, ever since. But we would have to acknowledge it. It doesn't seem to me what historians call like presentism or anything. And one doesn't have to, I've, I've never championed Washington or vilified him. That just doesn't interest me, I, I have to say. Um, but the, the fact is, the, the fact of the matter, so to speak, the fact of Washington and, and what he said seems to uh, have, if we allow it, uh, a shelf life that, that should be of interest. Again, none of these will come as a surprise, but maybe it's because what Washington had to say sort of got into hopefully our, our DNA in some sense. One is, has, you know, what is this notion of the common good, the commonwealth? You know, that um, he sort of exemplified in his person, he did exemplify in his person, a kind of a moral logic that says, you know, all things considered, I think I'd rather just uh, um, build a fire and talk to Martha about the old days or something, you know, and hang out in, in at Mount Vernon. I swear, for somebody who talked about Mount Vernon as much as he did in his letters and, and so on, my vine and fig tree uh, to pull from scripture, uh, he just spent a lot of time away from it. Um, but he did that because of a deep and abiding uh, commitment to the, to the common good. When you're called to do something, you got to step up and do it, right? There's a sense of, of um, of uh, disinterest, which um, that's kind of an 18th century term, but what today's meant uh, a, a sort of um, a, a, a commitment to doing what you need to do in spite of, or even if it's counter to, to your own. Um, one way in which this plays out, for instance, just real quick, I, I love these, some things never change, right? All along the way, he, he would be buried in these letters. Uh, there's, there's virtually hundreds of these letters from soldiers, old friends, and, and so on, who say, hey, uh, Mr. Mr. President, um, you got a job, right? And Washington, I have the response uh, that, that Washington uh, responses that, that he sends back to them. And he says, um, listen, I appreciate your service to your country. You're a great soldier or, or whatever, but uh, this is not going to happen. Um, there's no way that I'm putting you on the, the, the payroll. I have to be attentive to um, um, who's best uh, suited for the job. There's, there's literally, like I say, hundreds uh, of, of those. There's, a, thirdly, I would underscore this very basic, but seems to me terribly important sense that, you know what, for all of the, you know, boring inaugurals and, and so on, all of that, ritual matters. It matters a lot. These are rituals of power. The rituals that uh, they are regularized, they're forms of um, symbolically getting us over the thresholds of change that mark the shifts in, in, in administrations. And finally, I cannot help but think that um, deep, deep down in the Washington message is this sense that abides that if this, we're gonna make it as a, as a republic, we're gonna do this. And they weren't at all sure, but we have got to be vigilant. Uh, vigilant about what? About the institutions of um, Republican, what would become a democratic government. If, as Lincoln said, to conclude the first, his first inaugural, we want the better angels of our nation, uh, oh, better angels of our nature to show up, we gotta give them a place to live and what they will live in will be the uh, fundamental institutions of democratic government. So 
That said, I better I better call it here and turn it over to the bosses and see what they have. Thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Dr. Brown, thank you yeah. for, for your talk. I, I don't have any um, questions in the chat box, but if anybody would like to unmute or raise your hand um, and uh, ask any questions. Um, uh, Dr. Brown. Hi, Roger. Roger here. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you. I really enjoyed your, your, your book. It's a great piece of scholarship. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, it, it I appreciate it. So yeah. Wonderful. I have a question that's a little bit off topic, and I sure. just profess ignorance. Why New York as the capital instead of Philadelphia? I mean, you had the Constitutional Convention, and before that, the uh, Continental Congress. Why not the trifecta for Philadelphia and inaugurate the president and make that the capital? I, I don't understand the uh, right. financial. <laughs> Believe me, you're not alone uh, then or, or uh, uh, th at that point, point either. That, that question, in fact, was um, a live one and generated a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, testy uh, conversations, as, as, as near as I can tell. Um, and indeed, questions became not only why not Philly, but uh, why not Baltimore? Why not uh, Lancaster? Why not York? Uh, why not Boston and, and, and so on? Um, the short version of the response is, well, because that's where uh, Congress um, had, had alighted. But Congress was very, the, the both, I mean, the, the old Continental Con uh, Confederation Congress. Um, um, but, you know, in looking at, at, at this very question, um, it became a matter, and I looked at the debates and so on, because they were carried out in, in the paper and all. It was, it was, uh, remarkably similar uh, to like where a, a convention today might land. And that is, hey, we've got this great building. It's not being used. We can get this guy a house. Oh yeah, what's the house look like? Huh? You know what it all comes down to? New York put it in a better bid. Because the New Yorkers, of course they would. I mean, they, they, they scrambled. Um, but behind all of that was a general sense that, you know, really does really make more sense. So it wasn't long, of course, before, what, a year and a half or so before, in fact, they, they move it over to, to Philadelphia. Um, but it was, it was boosterism through and through, Roger. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? I do. I have one least out here. Uh, I agree with Roger. It was a wonderful yeah. talk. Um, yeah. Thank you. Lee. In in uh, his uh, inaugural, I, I mean, obviously they had uh, an incredible experiment uh, to uh, perform in uh, getting a government up and running, uh, a Congress, a judiciary, uh, an executive branch. Uh, how much of the inaugural address uh, really reflects? The, uh, the challenges that he saw them facing. Yeah. Very probing question, yeah. Um, and in fact, it, um, it re reminds me of some of the um, challenges uh, 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 I personally, but I, I don't think I'm alone on this. Oof. And I'll, I promise to respond to the question, Leon. But what I'll say, I think one um, one um, expression of of how, in some ways, uh, this is kind of an odd address. In that, unless I'm missing something, and I, you know, <laughs> I don't think so. There's not a word about what we would call foreign policy, and that's kind of odd. Uh, like I say, I mean, you can't predict it, but the Bastille is about to go down, but that things have been heating up. There's Spanish to the south and the west. <laughs> there's, there's Brits still very much uh, alive uh, to the north uh, and, and the west. Uh, there's indigenous people and, 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 and so on. So it's not as if, hey, it's all you know, good on, on, on that front. Um, my, I have so two responses. One is sort of impressionistic, admittedly, on my part. And that is that I, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that Washington was entirely clear about what was expected for this new thing called the president to say about foreign affairs. 
they were still trying to figure out like they hadn't even you know, committee assignments and and all that sort of thing that was still so so it wasn't entirely clear what was appropriate for him to talk about or not secondly and i think this is a less impressionistic in, in which is to say that um this is uh in some sense in some ways it seems to me a um um a powerfully sort of uh, um a moralized message. I, I didn't say that very good, but the emphasis seems to be on almost like a first things first, um, that if we can get ourselves square to the world, then we can take on these all these other challenges. But that means that we got to be what? You, we got to work on behalf of the public good. We can't be just be localists, what will become kind of a state's rights thing. On the other hand, we can't just become a a variant of a Republican monarchy or something, but it's sort of a um, what today is called virtue ethics. Like get yourself straight <laughs> to the world, and then you can walk out that door and deal with everything that 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 comes at you. But it is noticeably. I mean, the only really specific thing he talks about is um, along those lines is um, uh, uh, Article Five of the Constitution, which which is essentially the Amendment uh, Constitution. It just says, "Be careful. I trust you, but be careful <laughs> here along these lines. Give it time, and, and so on." But it, it, I, I agree, Leon. Uh, in that sense, it's not highly responsive to the moment, uh, shall we say? You know, that that, that notion of private virtue a private morality, he'll often refer to it uh, in, in the speech. Uh, so that's what he's up to there. We have I ask, ourselves I ask a question? Yeah, please. Is there time left? I'm, Anne and I are sitting out here in Seattle. It's still Sunday morning and we <laughs> greatly enjoyed your talk. Well, it's thank you for having it possible. Uh, I have a question, but perhaps we're running out of time, but uh, I'm interested in, Washington's uh, reading habits. Oh. What did he read? Uh, yeah. I, I, I understand that he liked to read Roman history, but uh, I'd be interested uh, in what you have to say about that. Yes. Um, and, and, um, um, it's complicated. Um, because um, the fact, if you go down to a, if you get down to a Mount Vernon, you can look on the show. I, I usually make a pest of myself and say what well, along these lines. But uh, I learned that just because um, as a as an academic myself, just because you have something on the shelf doesn't mean you've read it, you know. <laughs> and there are certain things on the shelf that uh, a person of a tidewater elite uh, would be expected to have on the sh shelf. You know, I mean, you want your um, you know, Gibbon, I, I, I suppose, and, and you want your Tacitus and, and, and so on. Um, he did, uh, and then, but the evidence seems to suggest like so many, so he was no Jefferson uh, along those lines, much less a Madison or, or an Adams, and he never uh, pretended to be. He, he did have a keen mathematical mind um, uh, early on as a surveyor and, 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 so, and as a, on the battlefield, of course, um, but he, he liked his history. Uh, right, and he liked, um, uh, the, the evidence seems to suggest that most of his time there, uh, during most of his time at Mount Vernon, um, he, um, he was, uh, uh, um, um, he loved the, the newspapers and it would have them uh, delivered, like lots of them. And, and um, uh, of course, white uh, Americans during the cl late colonial and early national period had far and away the highest uh, literacy rates in, in, in the world. Uh, so that, that, that print culture was very, and, and those papers, if, if you have occasion to look at them, um, they're, you can get online as well. Um, they're really interesting because they will carry uh, like learned essays, not all, not saying that, but learned essays on Tacitus or, or, or Caesar, um, uh, Cromwell, um, uh, that, that kind of thing. So he was, um, um, he never traveled. Uh, he, uh, 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 I should say, he never, he never went to France and he, he never went o o overseas. Um, he was sort of um, always um, a little self, it seems a little self-conscious about his learnedness or lack thereof when hanging around the likes of Madison, Jefferson, Adams, uh, and so on. 
Um, but he was, uh, an, uh, no question, an, an avid and aggressive reader. Yeah. But he was, as I say, he was self-conscious. Like even with the French, he, uh, he didn't know the language. Um, and it was a little embarrassed about that. He, of course, he never had um, uh, institutionalized uh, ed education as such. Yeah. And there's no order. I mean, you know, uh, no Patrick Henry or anything. And again, never claimed to be. Um, I think in part because um, he, he could be diffident uh, for sure. But, you know, um, I'm not so sure a Virginia gentleman was supposed to be a full-throated orator then or now, <laughs> if you catch my drift. That kind of, you get stuff done otherwise. <laughs> what do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question in oh, the chat yeah. box, if you don't mind. Um, uh, this is from David Diskowski, and he says, thank you, Dr. Brown, for walking us through Washington's performative republicanism and making the trip to the inaugural. Uh, did you find any linkages between the inaugural text and the speeches given along the way that would indicate that the trip helped write the address? Oh, well, good one, David. Um, uh, well, keeping in mind that the uh, address as far as I can determine, again, would have been largely composed that um, that went that uh, Christmas stretch um, before uh, the, the big trip itself with uh, Washington and uh, Madison uh, over uh, a glass of Madeira in, in, in the study. Uh, we're working this out. So he would have had it, as it were, in his breast pocket uh, as, he, as he went uh, up. Um, so my, my first inclination is to say uh, probably not. And, and indeed, as Leon was suggesting, I, I think it's, it's in some ways um, not especially responsive to immediate uh, the speech itself, not especially responsive to uh, e immediate exigencies, um, as if to say, in that sense, that uh, what we got to do here is to figure out, again, uh, the conditions of our shared humanity. Without that, nothing. Uh, please, Ron. And if anyone has oh, any sorry. other questions. Does Mr. Smith have a? Oh. Roger? Yeah, I, I just had a, a comment. Um, having, having been something of a student of Washington, you know, he's inaugurated, things get off on a pretty good footing. Yeah. Celebratory footing. But then the 1790s hit, and uh, I almost feel sorry for President Washington. I mean, he got hit with the Whiskey Rebellion. Citizen Genet was over here, basically going directly to the people, trying to uh, uh, bring them in on the side of uh, France in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. He had the XYZ affair, again, another uh, foreign intrusion, and the decade ended up with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Yeah, it was to say nothing of his own decade. cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah just no rest for the wicked, it seems. Wow. We're not right. it. And, and, you know, um, I mean, you're right, of course. I mean, it, it, the case could be made and has that it was not an altogether happy uh, presidency. <laughs> uh, and it, the case can be made because for reasons that you just identified, Roger. And it also might be suggest accordingly a way of uh, maybe pushing back on my claim that uh, he understood power and, 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 and so on. Well, he did, but he understood power as a, if you'll forgive, um, I hope this isn't a stereotype, but he understood power as a Virginia <laughs> elite uh, uh, a landowner does. And that is to say, you've got, and that's what like the Virginia House of Burgesses and then the, the later instantiation was a model of deliberation. It works so smoothly, uh, really well. Not that there weren't debates, but everybody behaved. They knew how to behave. They were all in a sense of a, of a cultural moment and, and things got done beautifully. But that's because they were like at, on the plateau of a mesa, <laughs> you know, they got things done. Well, the 90s, 
for all the reasons you've identified and more, uh, in, again, not least, including the fact that his own people in his own administration are lurching across the table at each other, you yeah. know, um, uh, puts, you know, su suggests what will become obvious by, say, Jackson's administration that um, that Republican uh, government is uh, is going to look a lot more messy, I think, than uh, Washington was ever prepared to, uh, to deal with. Kind of, well, not kind of. He did expect everyone to behave themselves, <laughs> and they yeah. would. Yeah, no way. And and it was unhappy. He was unhappy, you know, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Ben. Yeah. How are we doing here? Well, um, is are there any other questions on the on the floor? If I'm on, if I'm on, can you hear me? Oh, hi, Ron. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. From your point of view, on Washington's trip from Virginia up to New York, were the, were the people as interested in the president as president or in seeing a hero as a hero? My guess is they wanted to see a hero. Yeah. And they didn't care a, a whole lot about the presidency since there were states' rights dominating. Well, okay, Ron, uh, I was w with you up till the end, and, and I might have to um, respectfully uh, qualify the notion that states' rights was dominating, uh, because if, in fact, states' rights were dominating, there would be no uh, President Washington, there would have been no uh, Constitution as, as we understand it. That said, there was, of course, very strong uh, localist and, and state uh, uh, interest that uh, uh, cruised up uh, uh, along the way. What one doesn't get it in the record. Um, you, what you get are sort of special interest claims on his attention from various churches, uh, synagogues, uh, uh, commercial uh, organizations, and so on, who want who want this. Um, now, to the matter of hero or president, uh, hard to separate those two. Um, personally, um, again, impressionistic, but not. I hope not idle uh, in the sense of having read a lot of the diaries and journals and papers, letters to the editor and so on, is I'm not convinced that uh, many people even understood, including in Congress, by the way, uh, what a president really wants. You know, they know, hardly know what to call them uh, for, for, for a couple of years, as, as, as I mentioned, right? Uh, do you call them your excellency, your highness, your... Uh, all of that. So to, to answer your question, I, I'd have to go with the hero if, if one were obliged to, uh, to to choose. I mean, he's the he's the celebrity, uh, uh, no question. Um, but they know that he's uh, going off to uh, uh, hopefully do big things for uh, this this new thing. Yeah, he knew he was he knew it. I mean, for all of his, I think, perfectly genuine. Um, uh, uh, declarations of his preference just to stay home and with Martha, um, uh, as jo the historian Joseph Ellis uh, <laughs> notably uh, observed, the man uh, Washington, the strong, silent type. Oh, please! That this man understood theater. He understood the dramaturgy of power, and no one was better at George Washington than arriving and departing. He, he understood the inherent theatricality of both of those moments, and he maxed it out on that trip, even to the point of getting Knox and the, his old general to get Knox to get a really nice tailor up in Connecticut and make him a nice brown, uh, you know, not homespun, but still pretty observably, observably American sort of a suit uh, in which to give the, uh, take the oath and so on, because he knew people were, uh, he, looking at him, it's the symbolics of power. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> well, I think this concludes our program then. And um, Dr. Brown, I just want to thank you so much for um, oh, my, you know, my for pleasure doing for this. Sure. It's wonderful. And, uh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you and so I, much. And I'd like to also thank um, and Hamilton Henze Pyle and Dr. Kenneth Pyle, who are with us today, and and uh, the the namesake of the the pro the 
distinguished lecture series, which is great. Um, with that, I also invite you to be a, a member if you're not already.